everyone. It is indeed um, a pleasure to welcome you guys to um, the Advocates Exchange. I am Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine. I'm your at-large Councilwoman for the City of Columbia and uh, this is, is my baby. Those of you and some of you have been with us every single year, you, you know my story. I, before I was um, an elected official, I actually was a, a prosecutor for the State Attorney General's Office, uh, worked and volunteered with Sister Care as a law student, and uh, the rest is history. Um, there it started my passion for working um, in this work, and although I've never personally been a victim advocate, I certainly advocate uh, for changes, policy and legislative changes uh, that will assist and empower survivors of domestic violence. And so uh, several years ago, we started this Advocates Exchange as our opportunity to do two things. Number one, uh, to honor and thank you all who work every day tirelessly helping survivors of domestic violence. You know, your jobs are not easy and, and what you do um, certainly, number one, and when you talk to survivors, they would not have made it over but for uh, their advocate who was either the person who came to the hospital with them, like Deb, or the law enforcement victim advocate who helped them in filing the complaint and getting things together, or the advocate at the solicitor's office, or, you know, within DSS, uh, everywhere. We've got advocates who really work in the trenches every day. And so, again, first, our first thing was to thank you guys uh, for the work that you do. Secondly, was to also build a network among advocates and people who work in this field so that we can strengthen our bonds and empower us because, um, face it, the work that you do is not easy and sometimes even the folks that you work with don't get it. And so it's hard sometimes when you are beating yourself against the head, dealing with people who are supposed to be on your team and although even though they want to be, don't get it. And so we felt it was important to, and as part of empowering advocates, to strengthen the network uh, throughout our, our, the Midlands region of advocates so that we have people that we can call on. You might deal with someone who might not be in your jurisdiction but might need somebody else and you can refer them there. Or you might just have one of those days that you're like, okay, I just need um, somebody to talk to. So you can kind of build a network of folks um, when you need it. So those are the two reasons that we started this Advocates Exchange luncheon a couple years ago and we are so honored that you all are here. We want to be mindful of your time, and so <clears throat> we've got uh, lots of food, so feel free uh, to continue to eat, but we want to keep the program going because we know some people only have an hour, and, and then some people have some other things to do, so we want to be real mindful of the time. Um, our first, we actually this year wanted to, to break down into two different speakers, and so our first speaker is actually um, a very um, good friend of mine, and I tell people all the time, I, I laugh, I say, social media can be a blessing and it can be a curse. You know, uh, we know sometimes we see things on social media and you're like, uh, I can't believe it, and you, and you know, or it might take some of your time, and so you're like, it's a curse in that aspect, but it's a blessing too, because sometimes that's where we get our news, but also that's also a way sometimes that we connect with folks. And so I will tell you, that it's been a blessing to me in that I met this lady on Facebook um, and we have become very good friends and not just friends but soul sisters. Um, she's an extraordinary woman um, that has a lot of talents and so it is my honor and privilege, well I'm going to introduce her in a second, but let me tell you why I asked her to be a, one of our speakers today. Again recognizing everything that you guys do, we typically pick speakers and speak to the issue of domestic violence and bringing awareness or, you know, a few years ago or last year we had Senator Sheely who told us her story of, of losing her sister and other things. And so we a lot of times do that. Um, but this year when I was thinking about uh, you all and what your needs are, like I said before, it's a lot going on in your life. And sometimes, you know, when you deal with stuff all day and then you come home and you might be having to deal with, you know, being a mom or helping a friend or whatever, it's just a lot. And so sometimes you don't actually get a chance to, to really be uplifted yourselves and something to take care of yourself. And sometimes y'all might forget to take care of yourselves. And so um, I thought it'd be a great idea to invite this next woman uh, to speak because um, she is um, a, a women's empowerment speaker. She has her own company. Um, 
and I want to make sure it's endure the extreme, but she also has manifest the extreme. Um, so she'll tell you a little bit about that. So, but endure the extreme is her company. Um, but she is also the founder of manifest the extreme, which gives her the opportunity uh, to encourage and motivate others to move in purpose and live their best life. And so I thought it would be interesting or, or not interesting. I thought it would be empowerful impactful and empowering for us to hear from her because you all got to take care of yourselves and you need to hear those message so that you can continue to take care of, so you can take care of yourself so you can continue to take care of those that you deal with so um our, our first speaker today is otiti wagbai wright she is the author of southern tears of karma a fiction novel and an upcoming self-help book called smell the roses while you endure like I mentioned, her company, um, Manifest Extreme, empowers uh, particularly women, but she works with all um, on and motivates them to move in their purpose and live their best life. We all know that we have a purpose. Sometimes it's very clear to us what our purpose is. Sometimes it's not. But one of the things that she does is she is a very good at helping you figure out your purpose, but also figure out that you're the most important important person. And although your purpose might involve other people, you got to start with um, the number one person. So if you all would please in, help me welcome uh, Miss Otiti Wagbai Wright. Good morning, afternoon. I don't know what time it is. How are y'all? I only heard like two people. <laughs> Y'all okay this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not going to go into a bio of myself. I'm just going to go ahead and give you guys some practical resources that you can use on a daily basis. And as we already know, we cannot help people, individuals, or the masses until we help ourselves. Is that correct? Okay, listen. <laughs> When I talk, y'all have to engage with me because, you know, that kind of gets me hype, you know, all right? So we know that the only way we can help other people unless we help ourselves, correct? Correct. Yep. I like you. All right, so I'm going to ask a question. Can anyone in here define self-care? Anyone? Self-care. Taking care of yourself. I love that. That's basically what self-care is. For me, I like to dissect words. So I went into the dictionary and I defined self and then I defined care. So the definition of self is the identity or character of any person or thing. And then care is defined as close attention, responsibility, protection. So you put all those things all those things together and that's exactly what self-care is. A lot of people think self-care just came around, but if we think about it, our parents' parents were doing self-care. That's when our fathers used to go out and go fishing, not just for us to eat, but just to go fishing. That's when our mothers sat down and, you know, did quilts. That's when we sat down at the kitchen table and had our, heart, our hair press. Some of y'all remember that. That's when we had those talks with our moms and had our fingers polished and pedicures and all of those good things. Well, that's self-care. So what does self-care have to do with domestic violence? One of the things I found in my research is domestic violence, um, one of the triggers is stress. And sometimes people are unable to maintain their stress. Those are the people when you go to work in the morning sometime. Have any of y'all ever went to work and you come in just as happy and bubbly such as myself? I'm one of those happy, bubbly people that come in and say, good morning. And then you go up to one of your coworkers and coworkers and you say, good morning, and they're, not, and they're like, morning. <laughs> and you're trying to figure out, well, me. This is just me. I'm trying to figure out what happened to good. I mean, all you're going to tell me is morning after I done came in here with my coffee, my lipstick smeared, all, smeared over here because I was drinking and driving, co drinking coffee, and, <laughs> and I'm up there saying good morning and all you can say is morning. Well, everyone does not know how to handle stress. So many things has happened to me. You'll never know that days that I came to work, I was on blood thinners because I had two blood clots. When I first met Tamika, I was sick. I was in the hospital for a week. And people didn't even know on social media that I was in the hospital. I was still posting, giving people encouragement, giving, you know, people were inboxing me, telling me, you know, I feel like I just want to commit suicide. I feel like I want to do X, Y, Z. 
and I'm laying in a hospital, barely can breathe, but I'm giving you, giving individuals advice. The reason why is because just because I have something going on with me, it doesn't mean that I have to take it out on everyone else. And a lot of people don't understand that, and today that's why we have domestic violence. Okay, and what I want to clarify is a lot of people, yes, a lot of the mm -hmm. victims or the abusers are men, but a lot of men go through domestic violence. They are subject to um, verbal abuse. A lot of men do abuse through financial. Um, I don't know the term, but y'all know where I'm at. Stay with me here. So <laughs> one, one of the things that I teach people is you have to be content with yourself. The African proverb says, until there's no enemy within, enemies outside cannot hurt us. Okay, I changed the words around a little bit to benefit this speech here, okay? But one of the most important things people have to realize is you have to stop and take time and take time for yourself. The most important person on your team is you. No one else can take care of you the way that you need to be taken care of. Everyone, all of the self-development world, everyone is basically saying the same thing. The flight attendant tells you to put your mask on before you help anyone else. And that is so true. You cannot take care of anyone until you're taking care of yourself. So what does that look like? That looks like meditation. Anyone wants to define meditation for me? I want this table because y'all been looking at me like just right here. And I'm trying, you know, somebody at this table define meditation for me. For me, it's getting up a little earlier in the morning and mm -hmm. taking a few minutes of silence and reading some self-help and, and then making some positive affirmations. That's what I do. That's what I do too. See, we soul sisters. That's why I knew you had the answer. So that's one great thing that you can do for yourself. So I want everyone to stand up right now. Yes, y'all, and them pretty heels. I'm glad I wore flats. There you go. Stand up. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to take in a deep breath through your nose. And I want you to exhale through your mouth. I want you to take in another one through your nose. And exhale. All right, y'all can sit down. Y'all like that? I know y'all did. So when you're going through struggles, as most of you are providing care, and resources to individuals that are in need, remember to use that technique, okay? I'm not giving self-care resources to individuals that are victims of domestic violence. I'm giving it to you guys so that you guys can put your mask on first before you help someone else. It can be that one word, that one resource, that one activity that's going to help someone else, that's going to save someone else's life and you hold the key, and you have the same things, not necessarily the same things, but you have a lot of things going on in your life. It is very demanding to take care of other ind individuals. It's very demanding to take care of people that's in pain, come home, cook dinner, cut the grass, pay the bills. All of those things can be overwhelming at times. And if you don't take the time to take care of yourself, your job, you'll be defeating the purpose. So I'm going to wrap this up and say that when you're out and about, when you're helping this person, when you're getting this call, when you're running to the hospital, when you're trying to get someone into a shelter, when you're trying to help someone or just simply praying for that person, when you're trying to let them know that it'll be okay, when you're passing that tissue to that person, remember to sit back, take in some deep breaths, and exhale before you move forward, because it weighs a lot on them, but it also weighs a lot on the provider. Remember to put your air mask on the next time you help someone else. It is okay to take care of yourself first so that you can provide the best quality of life for everyone else. Thank you. All right. So. Is that, that's what they mean by waiting to exhale, right? <laughs> so, so now we know, we, well, before we do anything, we gotta do that and get that right. Let me, if you would join me back up here, and see, I, I call her Titi, so. Uh,
Titi, I want to thank you so much for being part of the Advocates Exchange. And y'all, she is, I didn't say this either, she is actually, although her company is national, she is based in Orangeburg, South Carolina. And so she uh, left Orangeburg to join us here today. And so I just want to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule uh, to be here and speak to our advocates. And I want to thank you for all the work that you do to empower people. Thank you so much. <laughs> so on behalf of the city of Columbia, I just want to give you a small token Aww. of our appreciation. Thank you. You've got a couple city of Columbia Circes in there. Um, and just to remember and reminder that uh, we appreciate you and we love you and you are welcome back here anytime. Thank you. Thank you guys. <laughs> All right. And she is wonderful. She didn't say this because I, I know her time was limited, but some of the other things that she, she advocates and that I've taken um, and I still have it in my office is sage. How many people use sage? I had never done that before. And then TT was like, I talked uh, talk to her and took one of her courses and, and was watching her on, on live stream. And so um, she gave me a gift of sage one day. And so I have it in my office. And y'all know my, my real job, my day job is a lawyer. And so I got all kinds of craziness that comes in my office here and there. Um, and so I started, I, I light my sage. And before I start to work in the day, I go around my whole office with my sage and just clear it out. And so that was one of the things that she gave me. And then she took me to yoga and do, did meditation and all that stuff. So thank you so much for, for all that you do. All righty, so y'all next, um, we have a, a fabulous speaker next as our keynote speaker. Um, and before I introduce Casey, I just want to say, I know we probably all the last week have been watching uh, this craziness with uh, Harvey, Harvey Weinstein. And those of you who came to the um, walk, I mentioned it there because at that point, um, he had issued a statement basically kind of apologizing. Um, to, yeah, for, yeah, and that's what I was about to say, kind of apologizing for what he did, but making an excuse and just saying that, you know, when he came up, this behavior was acceptable, and now he realizes it's not acceptable, and, and, and so he's apologizing. And so um, then this morning, I was kind of watching the updates, all these, you know, additional um, things that have come up, um, allegations, and, and now his wife has left him, and he's uh, checking himself into therapy. You know, that's the big thing when, you know, when people get caught, then they want to check themselves in the therapy and, and now they want to get help. Um, but some of the latest, most serious allegations are at least, at least three allegations of sexual assault. And so, um, you know, to, to, yeah, well, actually more sexual assault in the term, in the definition of sexual assault, there's a lot more of sexual assault. But yes, there's at least three of forcible rape. Um, and so at this point, I can't imagine how anybody wouldn't think that forcible rape was acceptable and now that they can just go to therapy and everything's going to be okay um, or that people will forgive them. And so um, we all know that work with domestic violence um, in the realm of domestic violence, sexual assault is a big part of what our um, victims deal with as well. Um, and we are at a time in our country that hopefully um, the conversation and dialogue will elevate to the level it needs to be. But over many years, it hasn't. I mean, just as, as late as last year, we were, uh, or people were excusing um, statements by our now president regarding sexual assault. Um, and people still say that some of those things are okay. And so we have got to make sure that we are doing better, that we are elevating the dialogue, we're having the conversation, we have zero tolerance. And so our next speaker um, works in that those trenches every day. Um, Casey is the Community Education Director for Sexual Trauma Services of the Midlands. And so in her role as a uh, community educator, she oversees the development, implementation, and evaluation of the organization's sexual violence primary prevention programs and community awareness events. Um, she passionately believes in engaging the community in discussions of healthy relationship development and bystander intervention with, will ultimately put an end to sexual violence. And so those of us who work with victims, we hear it all the time, but all of us are part of that bystander intervention. 
all of us are part of that. As we have this conversation about how Harvey Weinstein and others, we need to be elevating the conversation and letting people know that excuses that mask themselves as apologies or, you know, people, you know, making, I don't know if y'all heard Donna Karen's comment. Did y'all hear that one? Oh <laughs> that no matter what a woman, somebody said, what'd she say? She basically said, but these women, do you see what they wear? And they do this. And this is a woman has a designer who makes dresses mm -hmm. um, that she now is saying are provocative. So it, it, anyway, that is part of the discussion that's happening in this conversation. So until we as bystanders intervene and make sure that our comments um, and the additions that we make to the conversation may put the blame where it deserves um, and, and also make survivors and victims know that they are supported and believed, we won't make any changes. And so I thank Casey for the work that she does in this community uh, to help us with that. And so I know that we all will be uh, enlightened by her comments here today. So y'all please, please help me welcome Casey Singletary. All right, well, thank you all for having me here. Um, I wanted to start by telling you kind of how I got into this role. So I never knew that social work was a profession that people did. It took me a long time to figure it out. I was um, a science teacher. I taught science at a camp for adjudicated youth, and so they would come to us for a variety of reasons, usually truancy, runaway, some drug charges, nothing violent, but they would stay with us for about 90 days, give or take, depending on their sentence. Um, and over the three years that I worked there, I started to realize through conversations with them, hearing about their families and, and what got them into the criminal justice system, that a lot of their behaviors were a response to trauma. So either they were being trafficked by their stepfathers or by their boyfriends, um, or they were witnessing violence among their family, murders, domestic violence. Um, but a lot of their behaviors could be directly tied back to that trauma. And so what I began to realize is that teaching them how to build rockets and teaching them about the periodic table was great, but if they were focused on survival and being healthy, happy kids, they couldn't, until they could be healthy, happy kids, they couldn't focus on those other things. And so I became aware of social work and then I added in a public health focus so that we could really start to tackle the things that contribute to violence in our community so that we can all live in a, in a violence-free community. Um, and so that's really what brings us here today. Um, intimate partner violence is a public health crisis in our state. We all know that we have been in the top five the last, last two years, or I don't even know how many years. I know we're top five, we were five the last two years. We were number one the year before that, number two the year before that, number one the year before that, for the number of women killed um, by men as a result of intimate partner violence. And so this is something that we absolutely need to address. But what is often left out of the conversation is that it isn't just affecting adult women, that girls between the ages of 16 to 24 are actually the most vulnerable group um, at risk for intimate partner violence. And so we really need to start bringing our awareness of teens and teen dating violence into the conversation. When we look at South Carolina specifically, the 2015 Youth Risk Behavior Survey um, asked high school students about their experiences, and approximately one in 10 students reported physical dating violence, which included being hit, slammed into something, or injured with an object or weapon on purpose by a dating partner one or more times, and approximately one in 10 reported experiencing sexual dating violence. And so we focused on girls being the most vulnerable of this age group, but boys were also included in those surveys. So it is not something that's limited to women, it's not something that's limited to girls, and we need to include the entire community in this conversation. And it also goes far beyond physical and sexual violence. So as we know, psychological harm can be inflicted by dating partners in a much more subtle but still very traumatizing and damaging way. And what scares me the most about this type of violence and abuse in relationships is that teens often view these types of behaviors as a way for their partner to show that they care about them. And so what I hear when we go into classrooms is that, oh, well, there's a cute kind of jealousy. Like, if they see me talking to somebody and then they get mad about it, that's how I know they like me. Or if they go through my phone and want my password, if I'm not doing anything wrong, then what does it matter? Like, if I don't let them do that, then it looks like I'm guilty of something. And I really want that person to, to know it or to love me, and that's how they show that. And so they start to have unrealistic ideas of what healthy relationships should be. They all want love and affection and care, but we have these, we're bombarded by images of unhealthy relationships so often that it gets distorted. 
And so how can we expect teens to think differently when some of the examples we've already heard? Um, but other images, like images and advertisements that depict violence as sexy and sex as violent. So just in your free time, Google some um, Calvin Klein ads, sexual violence and advertising. Calvin Klein is a big one, American Apparel. And I love you know, those products, but the way they are selling their products is really creating a distorted view of how healthy sexual relationships should be. Um, we think about our TV shows and movies and how gender roles and relationships are depicted in those. Typically, it's some clueless dad who's sitting on the couch <coughs> drinking beer while the mom's doing all the housework and taking care of all of the emotional regulation and raising of the children. Or we bring in reality TV where they're glamorizing drama and violence. Um, if you've kept up with the Kardashians, then you know that they are what went on with Rob and Black China. Does anybody want to provide a recap of that <laughs> scenario? <laughs> So in that situation, it could be argued that it started off as an unhealthy situation, somebody dating someone for, you know, clout, fame, money, whatever, and then the response of posting inappropriate sexual images online for everyone to see, um, basically glamorizing revenge porn, played out on a national scale for our teens to see. The Real Housewives of, of you know, whatever county that we're in um, also glamorizes that drama. And then we talk about news reports of court cases that often call into question the motivation of the accuser. And as evidenced by Donna Karen yesterday, related to the Harvey Weinstein allegations, blame the victim in some way for contributing to the violence that was perpetrated against them. We can take it back to teens. If you remember the Steubenville case, there are countless examples of people finding out about their assaults online and when they are blamed for their assaults or their victimization. When we think about domestic violence, what is often the first question that we hear when survivors come forward or when we hear stories of that? Well, why didn't they leave? Why didn't they put up with the situation? Or why did they? And when we think about that dynamic with teens, what additional factors are at risk for them? One, crime, dating violence for them isn't recognized as a criminal charge, and then they may be in the same classroom, they may be in the same school with limited access for mobility. How are they gonna get out of that situation if their peer groups are, you know, they have the same peer group with the person who's abusing them, with social media and the impact that that plays in their life? That's not a separate thing for them, that's part of their worldview, that social interaction online. And so putting all of that into perspective, it gets to be really overwhelming, especially when we think about how aggression is viewed in our culture as really the only way to solve a problem. We don't solve it by sitting down and having conversations with one another and trying to come to some mediation or a middle ground. We're seen as weak if we don't get aggressive. I'm gonna prove how tough I am. You're gonna listen to me if I you know, show you. So what can we do to change? So I mentioned before, well, it was mentioned, my education is in public health. That's where I really put a lot of my emphasis and basis for the programs that we develop. And there's a widely used story that really describes the mindset that I think is necessary to preventing violence in our community. So there was a village some time ago, there was a village that was established next to a river. Much like Columbia, we have a lot of rivers leading here and that's where all of the, the work would happen. And so all the villagers were there doing their daily activities and they start to notice that somebody's floating down the river. So of course everybody jumps in to save this person because they're drowning, they're in distress. Just as they're pulling that person out, someone else falls in the river. You know, they're floating down, more people go in to rescue that person, and it continues to happen. Just more and more people to where they're exhausting all of their time, all of their energy, resources, just dragging these people out of the river. So one person, walks away. There's a trail that kind of goes up the river some, and so they walk away, and everybody's furious. They're, you know, doing everything they can to save all of these people, and here's this person walking away. So sometime later, gradually, the flow of people begins to slow and stop, and then here comes this person who had left, and everybody's like, well, what are you doing? You saw all this going on. We're all killing ourselves here, and you've walked away. Where, where did you go? And they were like, well, I wanted to see what was causing all the people to end up in the river in the first place. So I walked up the stream some and noticed there was a big hole in the bridge and everybody was trying to jump over it, but they kept falling in. So I just fixed the bridge and we solved the problem. So that's what we're trying to do when we talk about primary prevention. We wanna go upstream and figure out what's the hole in the bridge and how can we fix it. So what are those holes when we talk about teen dating violence? 
So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released a document in 2014 um, that connected the risk factors of multiple forms of violence so that we could really increase the effectiveness of our programming by focusing on those risk factors. Really, there's no sense in like working to replace the boards that were already there. We need to focus on fixing the whole. So what they found is that witnessing violence, impulsiveness, lack of nonviolent social problem-solving skills, alcohol and drug use, family and parent conflict, poverty and economic stress in the home and community, cultural norms that support aggression towards others, and harmful norms around masculinity and femininity all increase the risk for teen dating violence. When we include sexual violence, additional risk factors include community violence, weak policies and laws, and media violence. So if we want to address all of these things, or address those two issues, we need to address all of those things. So we have to work together as a community to bring about that change. I can stand here and talk ad nauseum about the program that, that we use at Sexual Trauma Services. We start at age three and continue through college, and I think they're great and fabulous, but it takes more than that. Our program only touches on a few of those factors. We do talk about gender roles, and we talk about how media impacts, influences those stereotypes and reinforces them. And, you know, influences our perception of violence in relationships. And we talk about setting boundaries and we practice the skills needed to solve conflicts in an assertive way rather than aggressive ways. And we talk about healthy relationship skills and sexual harassment and what sexual assault is. And we practice all of those bystander intervention skills, but it's done in a classroom. And so in some level, it's still an individual type intervention. And even though we're using the classroom in a relationship way to kind of help them reinforce positive social norms and change those beliefs and ideas, we as a community can create more change. So we have to come together to start changing the norms that support aggression towards others and really stop reinforcing those harmful norms of gender expression. We have to continue to develop collaborative relationships in which educators, advocates, law enforcement, alcohol and drug professionals, school districts, legislators, Title IX coordinators, everybody involved in this because it has such far-reaching impact. We all need to come to the table and bring our area of expertise and influence to really be able to create change on a societal level. But even before that, we really just have to stop being scared of talking to kids about healthy relationships and begin those conversations well before they get into middle school and well before they get into high school. We start these conversations with kids in our programs at age three, um, but if you have children of your own they can, or in your family, they can begin much earlier than that. And you can do that by having conversations about what? What makes a, a good friend? What do healthy friendships look like? Because those healthy friendships mirror our healthy relationships and that builds the foundation for respect and boundary setting and healthy communication. And all of this can be practiced in a, in a friendship type way. We need to have conversations about consent early and often and giving kids the right to have bodily autonomy and have them understand that they, they deserve respect and they're obligated to respect others. Um, we need to model healthy romantic relationships for the children in our life. If our romantic relationships and, and behavior is a hot mess, how do we expect them to do any differently? Um, and so using those relationships and talking to them about what, what they think a healthy relationship is. What are their friends' relationships like? What do they want their relationships to be like? And having those conversations. You can really use media, as much as we talk about the negative effects of media, you can really use it as an easy way to create teachable moments. So when you're in the car or at home or using watching a movie, using those things that create kind of tension or, you know, we react to as a way to talk to them about what their view is of that and do they want a relationship like that and how they think and how they feel about those situations. And it's really asking questions and being comfortable, understanding that you may not get an answer you like, but that the important thing is that they're willing to talk to you about it. So having those ongoing conversations with them and really encouraging bystander intervention so we can combat this don't be a snitch mindset. Because if everybody's like, oh, I'm gonna mind my own business, it didn't happen to me, not my problem, we're never gonna be able to change anything. So we really need to encourage others to understand that there's a variety of ways that we can intervene. I will never ask a child or anyone to put themselves in a situation that could cause them harm. But there are ways that we can intervene in a healthy way. 
If I see someone being bullied, I can go check on them and provide support. If I know the person doing the assault or the bullying, I can talk to them about why that's not good and how that could be hurtful. I could go to law enforcement if I see something potentially damaging going on. There are a variety of ways, and we're only limited by our imagination, that people could intervene, but we need to have conversations with kids about how to effectively do that. And really, it ultimately comes to understanding that violence against one of us is, in my opinion, violence against all of us. Sexual violence impacts everyone in this room, and it is connected to dating violence, even if we don't personally know someone who has been impacted or if we personally haven't been impact impacted. It affects our culture and the community that our children are being raised in. So before we leave today, I would like to ask each of you to think of one thing you can do outside of what you're already doing, but one additional thing you can do to prevent violence in your community. So is there any behavior that you can stop doing that contributes maybe to harmful norms of, about aggression or gender? Um, is there a conversation you can have with a child that you know um, about their relationships? Or is there something you can work on in your own relationships so that you can serve as a better, better model for the youth in your life and in your community? And so really just asking everyone to understand that change begins within us. Um, and I thank you for the work that you're already doing and your continued commitment to creating change in our community. So, thank you. A couple things I wanted to say, just mindful. Um, we all do this in our various capacities all the time. Um, and we sometimes, because we are consumed with this all the time, we assume or we take for granted that other people are as knowledgeable as we are about these issues. And so I think just clearly, just what Chandra was talking about, just knowing what the law is or what your rights are, or as Casey talked about, um, encouraging uh, behavior changes and healthy relationships. I think sometimes we take that for granted. And so as she challenged you guys, I also wanna challenge us as we leave is to think about how um, what we know, our knowledge, our experience in our professional world can help in our other circles. So whether it is uh, if you are a member of your child's PTO or whether you are a member of a group at church or you might be a part of a book club or something else, I think I, I would just challenge us. I know sometimes it's like, oh gosh, I don't want to bring my, per my professional life into my personal life. You know, I'm trying to get that whole work-life balance thing going on. And I just spoke to some ladies yesterday about saying that work-life balance really is oxymoron. There is no such thing as balance. And what I always advocate is integration. I think that th there is, is moderation in everything and you've got to, um, you, you have to uh, navigate your expectations for people but knowing that even though you don't want to bring your professional life into your personal life doesn't mean that you check your knowledge and your experience at the door when you get home or when you go to church or when you go to a friend's group. I'm not saying you need to be at the dinner party, you know, lecturing people about DV awareness and all that kind of stuff. But what I am encouraging is that we utilize our relationships and those other things to help other people encourage them to, to educate themselves and just know what's out there, especially as Demetria said, a lot of parents just don't know. Um, and if they've not experienced it, there's not a whole lot. They might not know where they can get that information. So that's my challenge to, to you guys this year as part of our advocates exchange is look at how you can expand your networks and at least use your experience and, and professional expertise to help um, us as we continue to educate the community about what's right and what's wrong and how we can impact um, the lives of the people that we serve better. Um, outside of that, as always, and I'm not going to put her on the spot and speak because I know she hates when I do it, but I do want to acknowledge and publicly thank Nancy Barton for all her work always in this community. So Nancy, if you would please stand and let us all thank Nancy. And then um, as we close, I wanted uh, to remind everyone if you know and if you don't know, inform you that throughout the month of October, we at the City of Columbia are continuing our toiletry drive uh, in support of Sister Care. And so if you guys within your circles or know anybody else, uh, uh, we've got our students at Sanders Montessori or managing that for us, um, but we are collecting toiletries and gift cards to be donated to Sister Care at the end of the month throughout the month of October. And you've got yep, that information on your 
tables about it. Um, so if you can and you want to, please help us spread the word. And those donations can be dropped off at City Hall anytime um, during the month of October. And then I'm going to look to my my dream team and ask them, am I missing something? And are we doing, am I missing anything? I'm forgetting. Anything. Okay. Uh, so lastly, I want to thank you again for, for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this time of fellowship. Um, I hope that um, you have learned something and that you feel um, like you can you can endure the extreme and you have some good tools to take care of yourself first and then you actually have some great knowledge to help um, spread into the community. So I hope you found this an empowering and uplifting hour. I want to invite you all please to continue to get anything to eat on your way out if you would like. Um, and then I just lastly, just thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you continue to do. And please know that we at the city support you guys in the work that you do um, and want to be a resource for you if necessary. So with that, I will end and we are now adjourned. Thank you guys. Thank you.